Rest energy is not part of that. So, but set, mechanical energy is just these two. Rest energy, all of you know the formula for it. Although if I asked you right now, what's the formula? Potentially only one of you would know it. I would assume. So let's try that. What's the formula for rest energy? Pardon? No. All right, I'll start you out. E equals rest energy. The only change you make to it instead of m, it's m sub zero. This is the rest mass. All that a rest mass is, the rest mass is the mass of an object when it is at rest relative to the observer. So when you've been finding, putting stuff on a triple beam balance and finding the mass of it, you're finding the rest mass. It, it's basically what chemists, chemists and biologists call mass. Uh, near the end of the second semester course, uh, we start differentiating and talk about when is mass not rest mass, and it's related to how fast it's going. All right. So we have our work energy theorem. So the total work is equal to the change in kinetic. We have non-conservative work causing a change in energy, thus it's not conserved. So the non-conservative work is equal to change in energy. And so now we can derive one more relationship here. Since total work is conservative work plus non-conservative work, because I have only two types. Oh, yes, awesome. It's related to potential energy. Oh, sorry, I cut you off. What is that? Is that some kind of energy? That's a U. Hopefully that's darker. In professional getting here, you got uh, all the chemical bounds things, but certain of them are reversible, and certain are not. No, then I don't know. You, can you put it one kind in the non-conservative and one kind in in conservative? If they can be reversed. Uh, you're talking about you're talking about chemical bonds, the potential yeah, energy of chemical the bonds. Chemical bonds, they're, they're potential energy, you know. Right, yeah, they are. Um, it, you don't have conservative energy and non-conservative energy. You have is the force being applied going to cause a change in the total energy or just transfer energy from one type to another? So in the, from a physics point of view, if, about to jump into second law of thermodynamics here. Um, the, if you have a chemical bond, and just so you know, I, I have not had a formal class in chemistry since 1981. So just throwing that in there. So if you break a chemical bond, energy is released. From a physics point of view, it theoretically would be possible for that energy to be put back into reconnecting them. Now, like probably from a physics point of view, you'd look at probabilities. What's the odds of that happening? And so I, I we start getting into. You know that there are there are there are reactions. There are plenty uh, reversible, and the other ones that just there are aren't. And, and other, other question, what, whatever dissipate uh, heat, no, thermodynamics, will be non-conservative or will be, or can be also conservative? The, it comes down to what is causing that. So I guess it comes down to what would break the bonds it, from a, from a, uh, molecule point of view, what kind of force would break the bonds of it? 
Uh, I would assume that would be a non-conservative force because you have all that potential energy and then that energy gets transferred into something else. Uh, I always think radiation, but it's because I haven't dealt with chemistry in so long. Um, I guess in the, yeah, I, I, it's been way too long for me to talk coherently on this. Uh, ask your question again. Let me take one more yeah. shot. Okay, Let, let's jump, jump to another another one. It's just the the increase of entropy. No, is is that associated with work somehow or not? No, that uh, entropy is the particles start to spread out. It just naturally. I guess if you did energy, if you have two particles colliding, there'd be some transfer of kinetic energy between the two. Uh, and then over enough time, everything would basically have the same kinetic energy to, to the point where you wouldn't be able to transfer anymore. So that's sort of the physics view of entropy. So the force that they actually interact, that, that one particle hits, hitting another particle would be probably a conservative force. It's probably an electric force or electromagnetic force that, from a physical point of view. Just increasing disorder cannot be associated just to work by itself. I don't think so. Um, it, it's been a long time since I've had thermodynamics too. Yeah, let me mull that one over and make a note to myself. Uh, back to this total work, we have two types. It's conservative and non-conservative. So it's conservative work plus non-conservative work is equal to the change in kinetic. Non-conservative work is equal to the change in energy. So we have conservative work uh, plus the change in energy is equal to change in kinetic. This is mechanical energy here that we're concerned with. So this is conservative work plus change in kinetic plus change in potential is equal to change in kinetic. Change in kinetic energy cancels out. If we bring delta U over to the other side, we have work conservative is equal to the negative change in potential energy. We now have these three relationships here, which are the work energy relationships. So there's a chapter eight master set or chapter nine master set where I ask for you to give a situation where conservative work is greater than zero or non-conservative work is greater than zero and so forth. Or to, I, I do it for each of these, greater than zero, equal to zero, and less than zero. And when I'm grading it, I look at, all right, so if it's the total work, did it speed up? Did it stay the same speed or did it slow down? Conservative work. Conservative work is positive when the change in potential energy is negative. And so that's what's going through my head as I'm grading it. And then this, well, I have to combine the two and try to figure out what the student means. Now we've talked about a lot of vocabulary here. I do want to point out that Every conservative force corresponds to a potential energy formula. We have two types of gravitational force, depending upon if we're talking to the generalized equation or weight. 
So we're going to have two different formulas there. The ideal elastic spring will have its own formula. So we need to be able to derive it. So let's derive it. So we'll take a situation. I have some object being shot up into the air. It starts out at some initial speed, v, at some initial height, hi. Goes up to this height right here to some final speed and some final height. I assume that we are zooming in on the problem after it's already been launched. So the only force acting on it is the force due to gravity, which is conservative. I know that the conservative work is equal to the negative change in potential energy. So on my right hand side, this is the negative of u final <coughs> minus u initial, which is just u initial minus u final. On the left hand side, well, force diagram here, I have the force, I have its weight acting downwards as it moves up. Well, this is the integral of f dot dx. Well, dx is upwards because my change in position is, is increasing as it moves up. My force is in the opposite direction. So this would be negative integral of f dx. And let me do a quick check to make sure I didn't screw up my minus signs. Okay, that's doing good. And this is going from some initial height to some final height. The force due to gravity here, assuming it doesn't get shot off in the outer space, is relatively constant. So I'm just going to assume it is constant, as we have been doing. So this is the negative force times the integral of dx. This is the one. Equals u initial minus u final. From some initial height to some final height. Well, integral dx, that's the simple one. That's just x. So this is negative fx from some initial height to some final height is equal to that. And so we have negative f of h, oh, we have a formula for the force, it's just the weight. So that's mg h final minus h initial is equal to u initial minus u final. So this becomes m g h initial minus m g h final equals u initial minus u final. So the question is, what formula can we use for u so that this is true? Close. When you have a minus in, in front of the integral. Oh, here? Yep. Because the force that's being applied is downwards and dx is upwards. <coughs> dx is in that direction. But the force is downwards. And so when you do a dot product in opposite directions, it's negative. What if the uh, u is equal to mgh? Yeah, not delta H. So if U is equal to MGH, this works. So 
U initial would be M G H initial. U final is M G H final. So U initial minus U final would be M G H initial minus M G H final, which is what we have right here. This is a solution. What is another solution, which would also work? FC. FC. FC? Yeah. Uh, so U equals FC, is that what you're saying? Yeah. I assume FC is force, and force. U is energy. Their units aren't going to match. It's simpler than that. There's actually an infinite number of solutions that work. Right, for those who missed it, the question I'm asking is, this is if u is equal to mgh, this is a true statement. Because all, all that the work energy relationship tells us is this. It doesn't tell us what u is. So the question comes down to what equation could we use for u so that this is a true statement? Because this ultimately is what we need. But in terms of thinking about it, it's often simpler to think of a formula for u. So this works. What is another formula that when I do u initial minus u final, I get that. Another formula that will get to u initial minus u final? Equal to this. No. Well, it depends on what you mean by WC. Uh, oh, capital. Uh, no, that. Because the conservative work could. Could I force that to work? There's a simple way of doing it, and uh, so. I, I might be able to force conservative work tacked on there. Would it be WH? WH? Oh, that's just the same thing. All right, so five minus three is? Two. All right. Four minus two is? Two. Three minus one is? That's a hint, by the way. MG delta delta H is the same, huh? No, I don't want delta. I mean, MG delta H is the delta U, but I I want a formula for U that would make this work. What did you say it again? I'm not quite sure what you're. I mean, the, the other formulas aren't very different from this, but it, there are different formulas. And I thought you almost said it. Well, I said times any constant, but I don't know if that's... Now, if I stuck, a say, a 2 in front here to multiply times a constant 2, then ui minus uf would be 2 mg M delta h. Yeah. So... Use a different letter? <laughs> I mean, like, H can be X or Y. Uh, no, that's not what I was okay. going for. Okay, that's not what you want. <laughs> Add a constant. Plus one works. Because if I add one to both of these, I'm just going to subtract it out. It's going to go away, or two, or three, or any constant. The formula is MGH plus some constant. 
because you took an integral? Or is it, are you just drawing that in there? Um, ultimately, probably, yes, it connects to that, because I guess if you reverse it, you would do a derivative and the constant would drop away. So if the conservative force is weight, the potential energy formula is mgh plus some constant. Now what that constant is depends on how you want to set up a problem. But it does give you flexibility of trying to figure out where do you want h is equal to zero. H just doesn't have to be equal to zero at the ground. So let's apply this newfound knowledge and solve a problem that you know how to solve already. I take a rock, mass of five kilograms, although it really doesn't matter too much. It starts out 20 meters above the ground. What I want to know is that when it is five meters above the ground, so we're gonna drop it, what is the speed when it's five meters above the ground? And so now let's apply Non-conservative work is equal to the change in energy. What are all the forces acting on it as it falls? Weight. Or force due to gravity. All right, so I have this force due to gravity acting down on it, or weight. Is that conservative or non-conservative? Conservative. So what is the non-conservative work being done to this thing? Zero is equal to E final minus E initial. In other words, my initial energy is equal to my final energy. A, conservation of energy. My total initial is equal to my total final. I have two types of energy. I have kinetic plus potential. It's equal to my final kinetic plus my final potential. I am assuming that this rock is not bursting into flames as it falls. It is not undergoing any radioactive decay. Here we go, chorus of angels. What's the formula for kinetic energy? One half. It's like two voices. That's how in sync you guys were. <laughs> What's the formula for potential energy? I guess I didn't do the spiel. If I ask you what's the formula for potential energy, the proper response is which one? What's the formula for potential energy? <laughs> what's the proper response when I ask what's the formula for potential energy? GH. We'll try that again. So, precious? Which one? Yes, which, which one? one? The one associated with that conservative force. Now, the rest of you. Yes, there we go. What I don't want you to do is get in the habit of potential energy automatically being MGH no matter what. I've had too many students who just get that stuck in their head, and no matter what, they're using MGH. It does depend upon the conservative forces involved. In this case, because we are dealing with weight, MGH is appropriate. Plus some constant if you want, but it'll just get, we'll get rid of that quickly. In the final squared plus MGH final. There's so many problems which start out this exact same way. At this point, can we get rid of anything? Yeah. All right, every term has mass in it. Anything else we can get rid of? Isn't the initial zero? It is, mm -hmm. the hint, the fact that it was dropped. So this is zero because it was dropped. Can we get rid of anything else? We actually can, but we don't have to. G. Yeah. This term doesn't have G in it. We can't get rid of it. Oh, sorry. 
I thought you were, sorry, initially I thought you were making the claim that the acceleration of oh, no, gravity sorry, simply disappeared. All right, so we can do that. Um, we don't need this part anymore. So we have 2 G H initial equals V final squared plus 2 G H final. Uh, all right, so this one we're solving for V. So V final squared equals 2 G H initial minus 2 G H final. which is 2 g h initial uh, minus h final. What's h initial? Two. Okay. What's h final? So 2 times 9.8 times 15. Um, so just shy of 300. Sure. 294. Yeah. That's the final squared, and therefore v final is the square root of 294. Seventeen point. Oh yeah. Sorry, I didn't see that one. One four six. Yeah. You lie to me about this. You lie. That's a line that comes from my aunt. Uh, when she and my uncle were dating, he claimed he was he was skipping night school in order to date her, and told her he wasn't skipping, and then. Supposedly, she said, "You lied to me about this. You lied to me about other things." They ended up getting married, though. But you know, four kids later, divorced. Ah, uh, Uncle Doug. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Doug, when he was in high school, shot, took a shotgun into school and fired it off in the cafeteria. Oh. It was Texas at the time, so you know you, he got suspended as opposed to arrested. <laughs> Anyway, enough trips down memory lane. All right, so we have the speed as it's falling down here. Now, when Precious said that the initial height was 20 meters, she made an assumption. What assumption did she make? Coordinate system. Keep going. She established the coordinate system as a gun being zero. Yes. And Lawson, what did you say? OK. Suppose she had said this was where h is equal to zero. What would change? Wait, everything's good up to here. So at this point, what would happen if h is equal to zero at this point? We still end up at the exact same place. This is the beauty of being able to add a constant to mgh is we can, it basically gives us the freedom to choose h is equal to zero wherever we want. Notice that when you are dealing with height, if you're dealing with vectors, we decide is up positive or is down positive. Here, the higher it is, the higher the height. Choosing this to be positive or this to be positive does not affect this at all. These are scalars we're working with here. It's already been built in, the, it assumes that uh, the height is greater when you get farther away from the source of the gravitational pull. All right, let's change the problem slightly. No questions before I erase the problem here? Uh, so let's say from here to from 
boxes here. That's 15 meters. <clears throat> Frictionless. And how fast is the box going when it gets to the bottom of the ramp? Say it again so Austin can hear it. 17.146 meters per second. Yeah, it's mathematically it's the exact same problem. Frictionless? Pardon? Frictionless? Yes. So the density does increase while it's accelerating. Now it's going a longer distance, but it's a, it has a smaller acceleration, but then it sort of balance out. But we still end up, that doesn't change, that doesn't change, same, same, same. There's at no point does it change. I point out one other thing. If we take, once we get rid of the masses there, we add one half V initial squared plus G H initial equals one half V final squared plus G H final. If I multiply everything by two, V initial squared uh, plus 2GH initial equals V final squared plus GH final. 2GH final. Let's bring this over. So I have V initial squared plus 2GH initial minus H final equals VF squared. Look familiar? We can write it slightly differently. Sorry. It is. It's one of the cake formulas. The difference is the cake formula assumed constant acceleration, but it turns out in this case, acceleration doesn't have to be constant. Now it is in this particular problem, but it doesn't have to be. Just so long as it's only conservative forces involved. Well, actually, uh, for this only if the conservative forces is its weight. Yeah, we got time. Plenty of time. All right, questions before I erase this and we get another formula. We can't have too many. Yeah. 